Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Packers War Room Podcast. It is Draft Eve. I am Ross Uglum. I'm a writer at CheeseheadTV.com. And joining me tonight are Cody Bauer of Cheesehead TV. Cody, say hello to the people. How's it going, everybody? Jacob Wessendorf of Today's Pigskin. What's up, guys? And special guest star, Brian Caribou, uh, formerly of Cheesehead TV and 24-7 Sports, and the host of the legendary Railbird Central podcast. Brian, how are you doing this evening? Very good. Thanks for having me, guys. And we're excited to have you. Let's, let's dive right in. Uh, let's talk about where you're at as far as uh, defensive needs uh, for the Green Bay Packers. I think it, time has shown us that the uh, defensive side of the football is going to be certainly emphasized in the early rounds as long as Ted Thompson is the GM and as long as Ted Thompson has uh, Aaron Rodgers. So I want to talk about the three areas of the front seven, because at this point, I think you guys can probably agree, the defensive backfield is is pretty set. I think that uh, after the HaHa Clinton Dix acquisition, uh, even with Casey Hayward leaving, those two cornerbacks that were taken in the first two rounds last year really solidified the defensive backfield long term. So let's let's rank them and maybe talk about a little bit what your uh, what your reasonings are. Defensive line, inside linebacker, and outside linebacker slash uh, we'll call it edge defender. Mm-hmm. Cody, let's let's start with you, considering you're the uh, resident Cheesehead TV draft expert. Where, where are you at as far as needs wise on the front seven? Well, I, I've always been a build from the trenches kind of guy. Um, I tweeted out earlier just the depth of where the Packers are at on the defensive line right now, and it's really kind of a sorry state. Um, BJ Rogers hiatus takes away kind of a rotational uh, nose tackle with Troy Guyon and. Guyon does have the flexibility to move out to end, but really his natural position is the nose. You look at uh, the other end, obviously Mike Daniels just got paid and deservedly so. He's a bona fide stud. Other than that, I mean, a casual Packer fan may be hard-pressed to even name another Packer defense alignment right now. Uh, We're aware of Mike Pennell, but he's suspended for four games. Josh Boyd, he's had a little bit of success on rundowns early in his career, but he was just on IR last year. Then we have uh, a guy named B.J. McBride, who again... You know, I barely know about uh, probably a lot of even hardcore draft nicks don't even know McBride's name. And then, of course, Christian Ringo, who was a uh, late-round pick last year, is more of the three-tech penetrating backup Mike Daniels. So when you look at the whole defensive line as it constructed right now, is really not a starting five-tech in the base defense. And, you know, you're going to be hard-pressed to find anybody else with Mike Daniels on the D-line who can actually push the pocket as far as the pass rush goes. So for me, defensive line – Ranks number one. Number two, I would, for the immediate need, would be inside linebacker. That's not much of a better state uh, with Sam Barrington coming off his injury, just related to start next to Jake Ryan and Nate Palmer getting uh, released. It's really not a good situation. Uh, As far as edge goes, I think for this year, for 2016, it's actually not a terrible spot to be in with Dayton Jones kicking out there to be full-time. Uh, and, of course, you have Julius Peppers, Clay Matthews, presumably, unless he stays on the inside. And, uh, of course, J. Ron Elliott, who I, you know, I'm always waiting for him to get more opportunities. I think he's such a uh, quality player and flashes every preseason. But, for me, it would go D-line, inside linebacker, outside linebacker. Okay, uh, Jacob, what are your thoughts? Well, I mean, Cody makes a good point for the Defensive line position, obviously, there's not a lot of guys there. Inside linebacker, he mentioned as well. One thing to look at as far as the edge goes now and in the future is, beyond this year, the only guy with a contract is Clay Matthews. Uh, And if there's anything that we saw this year and really any year in recent memory, it's that pass rush wins titles, uh, or at least really, really helps you win a title. So I think the Packers, you know, beyond this year, even if Julius Peppers decides to play another year, I'd be stunned if he was back next season uh, following this year, obviously. Nick Perry's on a one-year deal. Dayton Jones hasn't had that option picked up, so he could be another guy that's gone after this year. Packers really don't have an impact guy in that position. Uh, And as far as this year in the draft goes, of those three spots we've mentioned, the depth at the position is probably the worst as far as edge defenders go. 
D line has been talked about a lot. How you can get guys on day two, uh, late day two, even day three that can be rotational types of players. Uh, inside linebacker, there's guys that you can get in the second or third round. Really, at the edge position, if you want a guy, you probably got to get him early or not get one at all. So, I would say looking now and into the future, that edge you can very easily argue he's at. That's at the top of the list as far as needs go. The Packers have been looking for a running mate for Clay Matthews. When they finally got one, it was Julius Peppers, and they moved Matthews to the inside halfway through that season. So they haven't really had Clay Matthews as your, say, James Harrison to a Lamar Woodley because when they finally had that, they moved him to the inside. So I think all three are pretty good needs, and I think you can make a pretty good argument that any one of them is at the top of that list. Brian, go ahead and rank the three uh, the front seven positions as far as where you think the Packers draft needs sit going into this weekend? Yeah, I'm not sure if I can rank them. You know, I I might just say they're 1A, 1B, and 1C. I I mean, if I had to choose, I'd probably put defensive line and inside linebacker right up there with, with maybe, you know, outside linebacker, you know, coming in third just because they have guys for 2016 they're set there for 2016. Beyond 2016 is an issue, and that's why you want to get perhaps maybe somebody now. Um, but, I mean, if the right outside linebacker was there, uh, would, would I hesitate to grab him? Certainly not. Any time on the first you know, two days of the draft, uh, you're, you're probably not looking at one perhaps round. Well, I, I mean, I, should, I shouldn't say that necessarily. Noah Spence, maybe Emmanuel Ogba, perhaps fit the bill. I, I'd be hard-pressed to take those above the defensive lineman or the right inside linebacker, however. Uh, but certainly, day two, you can see them going on the outside. But, but yeah, I mean, all those three positions are, are, are need. I, I've said before, uh, I could almost guarantee I would th- I, I would put money on it that the Packers will address the front seven with two out of the first three picks. I have to say I agree with Brian, and I just want to say two things. First one being that as far as needs are concerned, I, I don't take into account the uh, the class depth. I, the, the needs are what the needs are. And I know that's one thing, Cody, that you really like. Uh, about taking a, a defensive lineman in the first round because you really like a couple of the top defensive linemen. I, and the other thing is that uh, there are 2016 needs that need to be addressed. And, and I think when you have uh, a quarterback like Aaron Rodgers, every year is a chance to possibly uh, win the Super Bowl. And so 2016 needs are – it's maybe not quite there, but as he gets into his late 30s, those those needs for the very next season start to become a little bit more important. And so I'll rank him. First of all, I think it's inside linebacker. If you really, truly do want to move Clay Matthews to, to outside linebacker, and I think that that's where he's the most effective. I don't have a problem with him rushing from the inside, but uh, that's just more as a, a package, not a every down thing. So I, I think that your, your number one need has to be inside linebacker. They need a guy that they can pair with Jake Bryan long-term. I think if you do that, you create tremendous depth because I, I really actually do like Joe Thomas as a dime linebacker and uh, Sam Barrington as a third inside linebacker. I think if you if you add a, a first or second round pick there, I, I really like the fit. Uh, I really like what it allows the defense to do. Then it really is defensive line. Uh, I, I'm a little bit lower on that need than you are, Cody, and this is the reason. I, I don't really view the Packers as a – as a 30 front team. I, I really view them as a two down lineman team. And one of those down linemen is the, the best defensive player on the team and has been for the last two seasons, Mike Daniels. So if you're only playing two defensive linemen on 65% of the snaps, I just have a hard time uh, getting that bent out of shape, especially when Dayton Jones will still play some defensive tackle on passing downs. Julius Peppers kicks inside on passing downs and uh, you can kind of make it up as you go along with uh with guys like Christian Ringo, with guys like Mike Pennell, Latroy Guyon, and uh, Josh Boyd. I, I think you can make that work. With that said, I just said it was the number two need on the entire team. So I'm not uh, dismissing defensive line as a need, certainly. And then finally would be edge. I really think that if they can get uh, J. Ron Elliott signed up long term, that would be something that I'm interested in. I, I really get a kick out of his play and, and think pretty firmly – 
that if he was able to be more of a five, six hundred snap guy instead of a two hundred snap guy, that uh, he could be maybe not a star, but certainly a more serviceable guy than you know, like Eric Walden started across from Matthews, uh, Frank Zombo. I think J. Roy Elliott has a, a, a talent level even above and beyond on that. So that'd be my third, obviously, then uh, in ranking those. Positions I I would love to see though an edge defender and I think uh, that's what we're gonna kind of segue into now and I'll start uh, we're gonna talk about well, some plus can I can I say something real quick about you some points and, and you made awesome points by the way first off I, I mentioned Jay Renelli and I'm glad you expounded on him he's such a good player I, I, he, he really is seems like he gets lost in the shuffle a lot um, you know to make him a, a significant part of the rotation is I think it's gonna be a big step for him and and for the defense on a whole and. You mentioned something earlier about me craving almost, you know, d- the desire to have a defensive lineman in the first round. And I understand the depth part of it, and I know you said you didn't look at the depth of a D-line in the, in the draft as far as, oh, we can push that off, you should be able to get a good, like, good guy later. Well, you even look to the bottom of the second round, the guys that are going to be available, or according to many analysts, my rankings, et cetera, et cetera, they're not going to be on the par with a guy you can get at 27. Um and, and you mentioned the two D linemen primarily is how we run our defense, and that is true. I mean, Daniels does need a breather once in a while as well. So to get another you know substantial pass rusher slash you know guy who can play in the base and and kick inside and, and push the pocket, I think is why I have D line as my number one. So I'm with you as far as I, you can't look at just the depth of draft and, and assume that you can get a good guy later. Chances chances are better that you can get a good guy later. But it doesn't guarantee anything. So if you have an opportunity to go and get a top tier D lineman in what's my biggest position of need, I think you know that's why you would pull the trigger on something like that. Yeah, you know we disagree, but we don't really disagree. I I will. I mean, the edge position does absolutely fall off a cliff, and and I think that that uh, Jacob would agree with me on on that. I'll start with the first round picks, uh, the the potential guys and. There's four guys, and I'm going to go with my no defensive lineman because I really do get, like guys like uh, Kenny Clark might slip and Adol- Adolphus Washington. There are guys I think that you can snag with that second-round pick that you, you can't really get, and there's four guys. And I guarantee you two things. One, that they won't all be available, but I can almost guarantee you one of them will be available. And my favorite first-round picks, in order, would be Leonard Floyd, Reggie Raglan, Noah Spence, and now I've forgotten the fourth one. I'll get back to it. But th- those three guys for sure uh, are, are the guys that I would lo- – oh, Darren Lee, Ohio State. So two edge guys, two inside guys. I think you grab one of those four, whichever one's available. If I'm running the show, which I'm, I'm clearly not, but if I'm running the show, you grab one of those four, whichever one's available at 27 – and then you grab the best defensive lineman on the board uh, in the second round. So th- those are the kind of guys. And Raglan's that thumper. He's the every down uh, inside linebacker that you just plug and play. Uh, you know, 800 snaps a season. Not a problem. Put him next to Ryan and you're set for the next decade at inside linebacker. Darren Lee's a little bit more of a specialized player. He's that chase linebacker that uh, Packers fans have been craving for years. Noah Spence is a guy I honestly think would have been a top 10 pick if he would have stayed at Ohio State. And we'd have a, a constant narrative about uh, right now about, wow, can't believe that two defensive ends from the same defensive line are going to go in the top 10. How did they not win the national title? I think that would be definitely something that's going on. And, and I'm really uh, kind of sad that at least the draft industrial complex is – getting all over my guy, Leonard Floyd, because I've been on him since the absolute jump. I, I I know he's skinny, but he reminds me a lot of Jamie Collins from the Patriots, a guy that they do a lot of things with, a, a thin frame, but th- this kid is an absolute blur uh, for a 3-4 outside linebacker, and, and I think you could do a lot of things uh, as far as you know maybe switching where he and Clay are, are lined up. You could you go, at, go at them with a, a Peppers, Ryan, Floyd, Matthews, four linebackers set, and, and absolutely bring pressure from all over. I think it would be a lot of fun. Brian, talk talk to us about some of your potential first-round picks and guys that you've had your eye on at 27. 
Uh, I guess maybe I'll, I'll just mention two guys here, uh, two defensive linemen, uh, Andrew Billings of Baylor and Kenny Clark of UCLA. Um, and they are both, you know, nose tackles. I do think Clark has the ability to play a five technique if needed. I think Billings is your prototypical nose tackle, though I'm not sure he could play a five technique. I mean, unless you're talking like goal line or short yardage or something like that, um, if you got Latroy Guy in on the nose. I, I don't know. But all I know is, you know, Andrew Billings, I think, is, is your replacement for B.J. Raji. Uh, he's, he's obviously... You know, and no nose tackle is going to put up huge sack numbers. I mean, you're talking if you're if you're drafting a nose tackle, you know, you're talking five sacks a year is, is a good number for a nose tackle. But I think guys does like Billings and Clark. These guys can at least uh, they have the ability to push the pocket. They they can move a quarterback off point. They can flush them things like that. I think these guys are that good. Um, and, and you know, I. I would be happy personally if the Packers ended up with either one of those guys at the end of round one. Uh, so those are two guys I like. Cody, I know you're going to talk some defensive line. Uh, come at me with your, your possible first round picks. Well, I'm with Caribou and then in that I love Andrew Billings. Um, his closing burst to, you know, closing a ball carrier, the quarterback is phenomenal for a 300 plus defensive lineman. Not only do I think he would be, you know, a great nose tackle. I, I have no qualms about him kicking over to three tech in a two down lineman situation and have the ability to push the pocket and, and make quarterbacks life hell and hell back there. But if Billings isn't there, and, and you know, a lot of mocks right now have him going like to Washington or even as high as Detroit. Um, I think uh, the other guy I would look at, and this is who I had mocked in my uh, Cheesehead TV Packer seven round mock, is Vernon Butler from Louisiana Tech. He's a guy who I think would uh, immediately start in the base uh, when, when, of course, we are in base, which is only 30% of the time. But, again, he has a phenomenal length, you know, 35-plus-inch arms, 320-plus uh, pounds, just a, a great uh, build for the five-tech spot. And, and, again, the ability to uh, bull rush offensive guards or tackles. He can uh, shed blocks well to get off of them to make plays in his gaps. I think he would be a, a really – you know, unique piece for Dom Capers, somebody who I think that they thought Dayton Jones could be. I think that's who he is. I would love a Billings or a Vernon Butler pick. I mean, going into day two, when you already have your D line, I don't want to say solved, but when you already have your bona fide stud to go along with Daniels, I think you can go on day two and have a lot more flexibility as opposed to being pigeonholed and to be like, well, crap, we still haven't addressed the D line, and now we're almost forced to it. I, I remember when we got in AHA Clinton Dix a couple of years ago, going into the rest of the draft was almost, you know, like a weight off your shoulders almost for me. It was, all right, well, we got the biggest need filled. We can just kind of go BPA and not not have any worries about what, what actually happens. So I think if we address the defensive line in, one of the, in the first round pick, I would have that kind of easiness despite still having an edge need and an inside linebacker need. I just feel like the defensive line, you know, defensive line obviously helps the inside linebackers, you know, take up blockers to allow them to make plays. So those two D linemen would be my top two or a few of my top two choices that could be there. Another guy I wanted to mention was Chris Jones, another almost like Vernon Butler, a little bit younger, more probably a little bit more athletic from Mississippi State. His motor runs a little hot and cold, but um, again, the, the same five tech length that you're looking for and the ability to, uh, to get after the quarterback. Uh, but I, I'm also with you, though. You know, some of my, you know, fourth and fifth best options for them are Darren Lee and Leonard Floyd, a linebacker. And I guess it does speak a little bit to the depth of the D-line and, and getting one of those edge guys slash inside linebackers who, who can be playmakers are, are going to be more important than a uh, defense alignment. But for the most part, my top ten of guys that I, I'm really targeting in the first round are going to be defense alignment. And, and, you know, you talk about Chris Jones. That's another guy where maybe not, but I also wouldn't be shocked if he wasn't available in the second round. I mean, it could happen. One of these defensive linemen that we think really highly of is going to be available late. They're just not everyone is going to take a defensive lineman. It, the numbers just don't bear out that way. When I evaluated that class for the Cheesehead TV Draft guide, which by the way you can pick up for the low, low price of eight ninety nine. I 
liked 14 guys. I mean, 14 guys that I'd be happy with uh, as far as, like, starter quality players. So I, I think you can get there. The one thing I will say is I do like Butler. I think he, he honestly does have the length and versatility where he could play nose. He could play in the two-man front, and he could play five-tech. And what I noticed about his game when I watched him on film was his ability to disengage from blockers. He's constantly making plays, not just pushing the pocket, not just holding his ground. He's shedding blocks and making plays, and I really love that in a defensive lineman. I I certainly appreciate uh, Butler's game. And and Billings would be fine, too, because I think he's a uh, a nose tackle with some, at least some, pass rush upside. Jacob, didn't mean to leave you hanging there. I know it's been a long time since we've heard from you, but what are your possible first-round targets? And if we've talked about them already, that's fine. But uh, let us know who you're looking at for Thursday night. Well, I'll give you my four-guy theory, which is what most of you did. Brian gave two, but I'll give four because I like to talk. So uh, first and foremost, I mentioned him already. That's Noah Spence, uh, the outside linebacker, edge player from Eastern Kentucky. I know he's got some issues in his past, but he hasn't failed a drug test since he went to Eastern Kentucky. I think that matters. I think his quote-unquote red flags are different than some others. None of them are very recent. He's proven enough to me, at least, from an outside perspective, that he's over his past issues. Uh, I think that he would make an excellent pass-rushing tandem with Clay Matthews. If he doesn't have the biggest impact his rookie season, that's fine, uh, because then you know going into the future that you have Matthews and Spence, at least, as your bookends. Uh, and you can kind of build behind them, whether that means bringing back Nick Perry on a shorter Connor Barwin type deal when he went to the Cleveland Browns, uh, something like that, or J. Ron Elliott if you could sign him up long term, like you mentioned earlier. You know, you can get you can build guys behind that, but you have your base to start with. And Noah Spence could also be a guy that eventually takes over as your leading pass rusher if and when Clay Matthews begins to decline. Behind him, I got two defensive linemen. Andrew Billings is one, Vernon Butler's the other. Kind of said some stuff about Butler. Like you said, I think he can play nose. I think I tend to prefer him over that because I think he can play nose. I think he can play five-tech. I think he can play in that two-man front. Also had him in my mock. I think that Ted Thompson will value that ability to move inside and out. That's something they did with Guyon and Raji both in recent years. So that's something I think that's valued. Billings, I've been a big fan of his since I started watching him back in February. Cody, I know he's your Twitter avatar. We've talked about him at length. Uh, I enjoy his ability to play on the other side of the line of scrimmage. I think that's something that, you know, the Packers outside of Mike Daniels, they haven't really had another guy like that. They usually have one at a time. You know, they had Mike Daniels now. In the past, it was Colin Jenkins. They haven't really had other guys. They had a spurt where they had Jenkins and Raji. That just so happened to be the year that they won the Super Bowl. Uh, But outside of that, the fourth guy is Darren Lee from Ohio State. Uh, I was on him at the very beginning. I'm a firm believer he's the best inside linebacker in this class. I think that he fits what the Packers need more than really Reggie Ragland or any of those other guys. And this is nothing against Ragland as a player. I think that Ragland's a very good player. I just think from a Packers need standpoint that he doesn't necessarily fix what I think some fans seem to think that he does. He's not going to be your chase linebacker. He's a, at least in my opinion, a two-down thumper. I do have a lot of questions about his ability to play in coverage. Uh, And as you'll see as kind of the trend going forward here in this draft, I'm not big on spending uh, first-round picks on a player that I I think only can play on the first two downs. Or, you know, if, if the Packers play against a team like them that likes to spread it out and throw the ball, then Ragland is really almost made... Not useless, but similar to that, to where he won't be used a whole lot. You really want a first-round pick that can't be on the field against the majority of teams. So uh, my four guys, Darren Lee, Andrew Billings, Vernon Butler, and Noah Spence. All right, let's 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 uh, move on to day two. Depending on, and, and this is something that we'll talk about a little bit later as well, but de- depending on uh, what goes on, more than likely Green Bay is going to have two selections on day two. So let's just make this one a little bit shorter. Uh, let's talk about potential day two targets and, and uh, the pros and cons of, of what maybe that player might bring to the team. And, and it's fine if that matches what you, you know, a different position group than what you talked about with your round one selection. Brian Caribou, talk to us about uh, one or two day two targets. 
Uh, I know one in particular uh, that I really like is Joshua Perry, the inside linebacker from Ohio State. So, you know, say the Packers address defensive line in the first round. I think you could get a starter at inside linebacker with Joshua Perry in round two. Uh, I, I love the guy. I think he, he's like 6'3", he's like 250 pounds. I mean, that's that to me is like an ideal size kind of guy on the inside, like almost a prototype, like assuming he's got the the speed to handle it. And, and there is kind of a question there that he's maybe a little bit too big, could get exposed to coverage a little bit. But I'll tell you what, from what I've seen on film, he'd be better in coverage right now than Jake Ryan or Sam Barrington or anything else they have right now at least. Maybe not the best inside you know, linebacker in coverage in the NFL, but he's better than what the Packers have already. Uh, I like him a lot. I, I think he could be a future starter at the position. Uh, and I, I would love to see the Packers get him in, in round two. I actually have done a little bit more study on Joshua Perry based on some of your tweets and how much you've been pumping him up. I had to go back and take a second look, and I have to say I was impressed and, and again, just absolutely blown away by the level of NFL talent on that Ohio State team. I honestly don't, for the life of me, understand how they weren't better, but uh, I, I continue to digress. I think my guy is is a player that I fell in love with pretty early on in the process, and that's um, Suha Cravens of USC. I, I really get a kick out of what um, the Arizona Cardinals do with Dayon Buchanan, playing him at weak inside linebacker and, and having him chase tight ends around. I think that's the exact type of player that Cravens could be for the Packers. I think you stick him next to next to Jake Ryan and, and add 10 to 12 pounds, and, and you've got a guy that as long as, uh, and, and this would be the case in this situation, as long as they've taken Billings or Butler or Chris Jones or whomever in the first round, if that player can help keep Jake Ryan and Suha Cravens clean, I think once Ryan kind of figures out what's going on, you look at his combine numbers, they're very impressive. And he'll be another year removed from that ACL surgery. I think you're looking at a, a pretty spectacular inside linebacking crew, whereas you know maybe it hasn't been in the past. The other thing I'll say about Cravens is I think he would really, really be a problem causer on special teams. I mean, like a, a real issue. And I think that, that Coach Zook would would really get a kick out of having Cravens on some of his uh, some of his special teams units because I think that guy would be just an absolute missile on teams. Cody, talk to me about day two. Well, first, just to touch on Perry and Cravens, both are actually a, a very good selection. Perry, you know, his, his change of directions as the kind of high-cut 250-pound inside guy, you're right, some of his, you know, agility is a little bit of a question, but... You know, he is a, a very good inside linebacker. I remember talking to uh, Dane Brugler of uh, CBS, and he thought that uh, Perry was a better fit for an inside at a 3-4 than, than Darren Lee even. I, I disagreed, but that's just is kind of high praise that he has. And Cravens is one of my bigger, I'd say, draft crush, if you would. Uh, watching his tape is, is really just a lot of fun. He can set the edge as well as, you know, get in the backfield and cover. He, he's a versatile piece that I think that Capers would have a lot of fun with, almost like a, in a Charles Woodson type role, though I'm not sure that you can just plug him in on the inside and, and say go ahead and make some plays. I think he'd uh, have a little bit of a depth in time. But just to go away from inside linebacker, I'll go with an edge player. And, and again, I, I don't mean to just keep going back to my mock, but I had uh, Shalik Calhoun from Michigan State mocked in the second round. And as an edge player, there you'd be hard-pressed to find anybody more productive than he was the last three years that he started for the Spartans. I mean, 20-plus uh, sacks and, and several tackles for loss. Uh, perfect build for an a outside linebacker, 6'4", 250. Um, he had a great three-cone time, which is something I know that Thompson values in a, in a pass rusher, You know, going back to Clay Matthews, really. I think that as a rotational pass rusher early on in his career, I think he could make some noise and, and help out. Um, if you remember back to 2010, we had Matthews on the strong side on the left defensive end and and uh, others rotating on the right defensive end. I think Calhoun, as a rotational piece in his rookie year, could could be a you know five, six-plus sack kind of guy in, 
and eventually develop into a, a better, more well-rounded uh, run defender as well as pass rusher and, and could be the starter going forward opposite Matthews on either side. So uh, for me, I think the D-line was addressed in the first round. And again, you know, it opens up opportunities. Whereas if you don't take a D-lineman, thinking about some D-lineman in the second round, I know, Ross, you did the, the G's Head TV guide work on defensive linemen, so you have a better idea. But I also... I, I'm trying to think and, and playing out some scenarios. I'm thinking like Austin Johnson from Penn State might be the best available, and you know I'd be wishful thinking to think Kenny Clark uh, would drop down or, or Robert Kondiche. I don't know if they drop all the way down to the bottom of the second. So when you when you look at who could be there, like worst case scenario is kind of how I like to play it out. I think you almost for me forcing to go defensive line early to get your stud. And then you have options as a pass rusher or inside linebacker, the two guys you mentioned, or, or Calhoun or even Kyler Fackerel on the outside uh, in the second round, uh, guys that you could look for to uh, be a rotational piece early on in their in their rookie season. Jacob Westendorf, did Cody just steal your guy? He absolutely did. It was kind of funny, annoying. It almost felt like one of us was kind of stealing from each other when we did our respective mocks. I promised we did not collaborate, but... Charlie Calhoun was on my list as well. He was my second-round pick, considering I had them taking Vernon Butler in the first. Uh, so one thing I want to say about Calhoun is just I watched him play You know, some top-level teams, Oregon, Ohio State. We mentioned Ohio State earlier as someone that isn't sure how they weren't better. As the resident biggest Ohio State hater on the planet, I'm not upset with that one bit. Uh, but... Taylor Decker, you know, you named some of the linemen that he faced this year, and Calhoun played on the other side of the line of scrimmage. There's a lot of talk about how Ezekiel Elliott didn't get a lot of carries against Michigan State. Some of that really did have to do with the fact that the Michigan State defensive line dominated the Buckeyes in the trenches, and that started with Calhoun. But for the sake of being different, guys on day two, I'll go to a position the Packers actually have already addressed this offseason, and that's tight end. I know, Cody, we talked probably the night of or shortly after the national championship game. And we're like, okay, three tight ends. Jordan Leggett of Clemson, Jake Budd of Michigan, O.J. Howard of Alabama. And then within like minutes of each other, all three decided they were going back to school. So none of those guys are available, which to me means no player is worthy of the 27th pick in the draft. I know Hunter Henry has been mocked there a lot before the Jared Cook signing, uh, but I don't think he's worth that selection. However... If they were to fall to the second-round pick, there's two guys there, maybe three depending on the value. Uh, but you've got Austin Hooper from Stanford. You've got Hunter Henry, as I mentioned, from Arkansas, and Jarrell Adams from South Carolina. I know that the Packers have Jared Cook, and a lot of people seem to believe that means, okay, well, they're done at tight end for the year, and they could just look forward to next year's class. I don't know if that's necessarily true. Mike McCarthy's talked about big targets running through the middle of the field. Well, when Richard Rodgers runs, it looks like he's – jogging, they could potentially look to replace him or make him a specialist kind of player. Red zone. You know, blocker, they think he's a good blocker. I don't necessarily believe with that. Possession receiver, role player type. And that's fine if that's what Richard Rodgers is. But he's your number two, borderline number three tight end in this scenario. Henry, Hooper, and Jarrell Adams all offer. Adams the most athletic upside, no doubt. Uh, Henry and Hooper can give you a guy that can actually, they actually do block very well. And they give you some upside in the passing game that I don't think Richard Rodgers gives you. So if the Packers can get a guy like that in the second round, depending who they get in the first round, obviously, defensive lineman, front seven player uh, would be my designation. We'll talk about wish list. I think you'll see front seven is probably going to be all four of our picks for that wish list in the first round. But they get their front seven player in the first round. If there's a tight end there that they can get and they think he's, one, a long-term asset, or two, just a good compliment to Jared Cook slash Richard Rogers. I think any of those three guys would be worth pulling the trigger on at pick number 57. Thank you, Jacob. Brian, why don't you give us two or three, and this is what everybody wants to talk about when you're talking draft. Why don't you give us two or three of your biggest sleepers in this year's class, and then I know you've got stuff going on, so we will bid you adieu. <laughs> uh, well, uh, I'm just trying to think here. Uh, you know, I, I kind of... I'll start with this. A guy who I think maybe it would be a round three kind of guy. I don't know how deep we're going for sleepers here, I guess, but maybe we've already kind of covered round one, round two here, but maybe a round three guy would be 
uh, at outside linebacker, Dottie Nicholas from Virginia Tech. And uh, what you saw out of him at Virginia Tech, he had a really productive junior season, fell off as a senior, but what he did is went from, you know, playing a defensive end his junior year to, to playing like a, a 230-pound three technique for Virginia Tech his senior year. You could understand at 230 pounds, if you're playing inside the tackle box, why his production may have gotten cut off. And I think if you put him at, you know, six foot two and 230-some pounds at outside linebacker, that would be right in his wheelhouse. Uh, and I think he was kind of out of position at Vatek. Um, I think he could be a good, you know, late day two, even maybe early day three uh, kind of guy if he would fall that far that could really be a, a good, you know, pass rusher for the Green Bay Packers. He doesn't have the ideal length. He's like six foot two. Maybe you'd like, you know, have him a little bit taller than that. Uh, but he does have long arms and. Um, you know, maybe he's not a three-down type of guy. Maybe he is more of a, a situational pass rusher. And I think by the time you get to round three, round four, uh, I mean, that's that's not bad, uh, getting that kind of guy. Uh, you don't necessarily need a three-down type of guy. It would be nice if you did, but uh, not necessar- uh, necessary. And uh, I'll just throw one more name very briefly. Uh, I know in my mock draft I, I did – Seventh round, uh, my third round uh, target was um, Connor McGovern uh, of Missouri, and this would be you know one of the places the Packers could address the offensive line. Something we haven't talked a lot so far, and you know obviously by the time the third, fourth round comes around, a lot of the best ones come off the board. And Connor McGovern may be not a left tackle, although he did play it at Missouri, but he could be a right tackle potentially, definitely a guard probably either side of the offensive line. Uh, and that's especially, you know, intriguing when you got guys like both Justin and TJ Lang uh, with their contracts expiring. So uh, a versatile guy, a really strong guy. But there you go. Daddy Nicholas and Connor McGovern, uh, potential round three type of targets. And Far- Fargo. Thanks North- a lot, guys. Th- thanks for coming on, Brian. We really do appreciate it. All right. Take care. That's a Fargo, North Dakota native, Connor McGovern, that Brian Caribou is showing some love, in, and I certainly appreciate that. I'll talk about my big three guys as far as sleepers, and, and I just, in general, mean guys that uh, I believe are going to be underdrafted. I think that's sort of the general definition of, of sleeper, but the first guy that I think might be a fourth or fifth round pick that I would take, depending on need, I would take in the second or third round is uh, Paul Perkins of UCLA. Jacob, you had a, a, a article up about him today and his potential fit with um, with the Packers, and I, I'm just in love. I mean, I, I think he's a tremendous running back. I think he's a uh, even a potential um, Eddie Lacy replacement if, if Lacy's not a part of the, the franchise in, in 2017. Even if he is, I think he'd be a tremendous, tremendous compliment to Lacey. Uh, if, if they let Starks go in your 2017 backfield looks like Paul Perkins, Eddie Lacey, and John Crockett, I think you you got to feel really, really good about that. My second guy, and I've been doing a little bit more uh, research on him, and, and, and as part of the reason I'm, I'm warming up to the idea of defensive line is in the first round because I really like B.J. Goodson out of Clemson. I, I really do. I, I like his game. I think he played in front of some pretty darn talented uh, defensive linemen, especially on the on the edge there with Dodd and, and Lawson. But he was a very good player in his own right, and I think uh, while he might not be that chase legend or that chase linebacker that everybody's just been clamoring for, I think he's a starter. I, I think if you have him and Jake Ryan, you feel pretty good about that. I think B.J. Goodson might be a, a guy you could get in round three or, uh, you know, maybe early round four if they uh, end up with an extra pick for some strange reason. And and the last guy I'll talk about, and this is my my favorite player in the draft just based on where he's going to go and, and what I think he's going to do as a professional football player, and that's Sterling Shepard. I, I know that, especially Cody, because Cody loves height, weight, and speed, but... People are going to go at me because he's 5'10". I don't care. That dude is always open. He runs 
outstanding routes, and I think he would be uh, a welcome addition to the Packers in round three if, if that would, would be something that would still be available. He'll get knocked down because of his height, but if you watch what he did at Oklahoma, he, he dominated some games. I mean, that guy is just an incredible football player. When you turn on the film, and, and, and I'm, I'm going to hear that you know they've got Randall Cobb, and they don't need more slot receivers. They've got Ty Montgomery, too, but I'm not convinced that Sterling Shepard can't win on the outside. He, he's uh, he's part of my honorary always open club, which is you know the the club that I, I kind of started last year when trying to describe why I loved Amari Cooper so much and and why he was my number one overall player in last year's draft classes. I, I think that Sterling Shepard is is also at least a junior member of the always open club. Cody, what are your what are your thoughts? What are your sleepers? And then we'll get to Jacob. Uh, again, let me just quick jump in on your uh, about Sterling Shepard. I am a big height weight speed guy. That's you know NFL is built on that. But Sterling Shepard is surprisingly my number three wide receiver. So I don't think he falls to uh, to round three. But if he is there, you're right. The value just eventually smacks you in the face, and, and you have to pull the trigger on something like that. And and I'm a big Shepard guy. You talk about route running. He is probably the best one in the class. So. Um, I'll go with wide receiver, and this is kind of a popular sleeper pick. I remember watching him during the season really before the hype train came on, not to uh, toot the first horn or anything like that, but the Mike Thomas, wide receiver from Southern Miss, he has just about everything you want out of wide receiver. He kind of fits the Packer mold. Uh, six foot, six one, 200 pounds. He just incredibly gifted body control, makes tough catches. Um, he has a touchdown against a I think Louisiana Tech, where he just it makes this one-handed spinning ballerina type play. Uh, he, he can run after the catch. He takes screens to the house. He has a good understanding of the field and, and uh, run to open area. Um, he does have occasional drops here and there. But for me, if, if you know Packer fans, some of us or some of them are are speaking about taking a wide receiver as early as round one, if if the value is there, and uh, I can't get on board with that unless it's maybe Josh Doxson, but. You know, Mike Thomas, if we wait on it, I think he would be a, a sleeper wide receiver that I think could come in and immediately challenge Aberderis and Janice for a, a roster spot and potentially even move into a, what I think is a, a starting role because I think he's that good. A um, couple other guys, as far as defensive line goes, I want to mention Dean Lowry from Northwestern. Again, he's 6'6", 296 pounds. The quintessential five tech. Uh, he doesn't have the ideal length. That, you know, his arms are kind of short. But when you watch him, and I know he had a big game against the Badgers for Wisconsin fans out there. He, he's all over the field. You know, he's making plays in the backfield. He can hold up his guy in the in the run game. He makes plays off his frame, which is I know Ross, you mentioned earlier. I, I just love it when defensive linemen actually do something as opposed to just stand there and and take up blocks. I think. He's kind of the, you know, to go all stereotypical, the blue-collar, hard-working defense alignment, I think, would push everybody else in the line to be that much better. I think uh, double-dipping on the D-line for me is a must this year, and if we don't do it early, if we grab one early and, and wait until, you know, the later rounds to grab another one, I think Dean Laurie is a, uh, a name to keep your eye out for Northwestern. Jacob, give me a sleepers. That is Rockford, Illinois native Dean Lowry of Rockford Boylan High School, by the way. So well done, Cody Bauer. Uh, sleepers, a lot of talk of running back. Uh, Ross, you stole one of my guys with Paul Perkins, but that's fine. I have another. Uh, that is DJ Foster from Arizona State. He's another guy, a lot of talk of CJ Procise having played receiver. Foster did the same thing. Smaller guy, scat back type. Catches passes really well. Uh, he'll probably get knocked because of his frame and maybe a lack of breakaway speed. But very good pass catcher, shifty in the open field. And you're probably looking at a guy that you can get in the sixth or seventh round. I think that's a really good spot for a sleeper. Uh, wide receiver is a position that we haven't really talked about. In recent days, we've had some Twitter arguments about when the Packers could target a wide receiver. There's some names coming up that are of the first-round variety. Josh Doxson is a name that comes up. I'm looking at his teammate. Colby Listenby, that's a guy who can run uh, really fast. The Packers, if they do add a receiver, I think it's a vertical threat type, somebody that can get down the field. Some would argue, and I think a lot would argue, the Packers already have that guy with Jeff Janis and obviously Jordy Nelson coming back. The difference between Janis and Listenby is Listenby can run more routes than just the nine and the drag. So that's something of value. Janis is a very good player on special teams and has a very tantalizing skill set as a receiver, but 
as we've seen in Minnesota, our neighbors to the north, Cordero Patterson, sometimes people just don't learn how to run routes. If Janice, as a seventh-round pick, is just a special teams player, that is very, very good thing. Listen, B could be a guy that comes in, they groom him. Uh, maybe he's a replacement for Devontae Adams. Or if and when Jordy Nelson, knock on wood, gets injured or retires uh, or isn't with the team anymore for whatever reason, Listen, B could be a guy that comes in. And then another guy, you're talking about a fourth-rounder offensive lineman, Joe Hag from North Dakota State. I think the Packers need a swing tackle. I know some people have mocked tackle to the Packers in round one. I don't like that idea because you don't draft a – backup offensive tackle that you don't have planned for the future in round one. I think David Bakhtiari is a very good player that they're going to pay. Brian Bulaga is the highest paid offensive right tackle in the NFL. And with that being said, I don't know that adding a guy in the first round that isn't going to see the field in the first, or in his first year, unless something goes terribly wrong, is necessarily a good investment. Hag can be a guy, I think he can play both tackle spots. I think, Ross, you saw plenty of them. You can give a way better scouting report on Hag than I can. A lot of hype going to Carson Wentz, and deservedly so. He'll be a top-two pick. But Hag will be a very good player, I think, in the fourth round. I think he'd be a good swing tackle. Uh, somebody that, instead of, oh, my God, David Bakhtiari slash Brian Belagas hurt, and we got to hope for Don Barclay. It's like, okay, we have Joe Hag now. That's not such a bad thing out there. So those are my guys. DJ Foster, Colby Listenby, and Joe Hag, your guy out of North Dakota State. Yeah, I've seen Joe Hag play football live about 46 times. So uh, Joe, Joe is Joe is kind of my guy. Uh, I was talking about an extra pick, and, and I want to kind of hash this out with you two right now. The, the, the rumor uh, is, is circulating about both Denver and Cleveland wanting to jump up and, and get a quarterback, and that would be – uh, I, I mean, my thoughts are they're probably jumping Arizona because of the age of Carson Palmer. I know Cody mentioned that they might need a cornerback in our pre-production meeting, but at this point, uh, everybody's assuming that Paxton Lynch, uh, Jared Goff, and of course Carson Wentz are going to be gone by the time that the Packers pick. But there is still Christian Hackenberg and or uh, Connor Cook for people to be uh, I guess, excited about. I mean, not me, but, like, people. And so the the concept would be, more than likely, Cleveland's late, late third-round pick, or, excuse me, Denver's late, late third-round pick, or uh, I think Cleveland somehow now has, like, the, the first two picks in the fourth round. Guys, how excited would you be, first of all, if Ted was able to pull that off? And secondly... What do you think that there is the potential to miss out on if that happens? Jacob, why don't you go first? Well, we talked about this in what we used to affectionately refer to as the dark episode, which is before we start recording. In order to move up from 31 or 32 to 27, you're looking at maybe an extra third or fourth round pick, kind of depending on how the value shakes out, what the Packers also add in. Some of those will depend on who's still on the board. If it's an edge guy, I'll go back to my guy Noah Spence, for example. The guys, the teams behind the Packers at 27, you've got Kansas City there, Carolina, Arizona. If they go to 31, then none of those three teams are probably looking at an edge guy. So what the Packers have essentially done is pick up a third-round pick and probably still get the guy they want anyways. Even if it's not Noah Spence, you're looking at Vernon Butler as a possibility. Maybe Andrew Billings is still there. Another defensive lineman. I think it's a good, sound strategy almost always to try and trade down. Uh, and in this case, I think that the Packers can trade down without fear of missing on their guy, which is always the fear when you move down, that you move down and somebody picks your guy right in front of you. I remember, I think it was a couple of years ago, the Packers moved down and they wanted Stedman Bailey. Uh, the Rams jumped right in front of him and took Stedman Bailey. Now, that turned out okay because Bailey hasn't amounted to much. That could be because of the quarterback situation in St. Louis. But the Packers wanted a guy, and they couldn't get him because he wasn't there anymore. They ended up getting David Bakhtiari, which turned out really good, actually, if you look at the way the team is constructed now. But, I mean, in general, if the Packers can do that, I would be very excited, especially if they can still get one of the three guys I just mentioned. Well, I think that's part of it, too, is that like, me complaining about taking one of those defensive linemen, part of it is because 
I'm not saying that they're like a horse of pieces players, but they all bring different things to the table at kind of the same level. So the 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 Billings or Butler or A. Sean Robinson or you know whatever guy, if one of those guys gets taken and you can take the other one four picks later and snag a late third round pick, great. Because that's just gravy. What do you think about that, Cody? I'm not sure if we lost him or not. To rebut, I'll ask or I'll answer your question, Jacob. I well, the difference between 31 and 32 picks, or you know, pick 31, 32 is much different than pick 57. I'm with you, Ross, in, in thinking that you can still get a D lineman of the same caliber as you would at pick 27, around 31, 32. Obviously, you're not dropping down as, as far as you would be if you're picking at the end of the second. So, I would be in favor of this. I guess selfishly for me. Uh, I would be a little bit bummed if we didn't make a selection on Thursday night. Um, just cause then we'd have to wait, you know, a whole another day. But you know, not only could Kenny Clark fall or um, Ashawn Robinson potentially, although NFL seems to love them more than a lot of us draft next. But you know, you're looking at guys like um, Robert Kamdiche or Camille Carrera, Jonathan Bullard. I think is a good defense alignment from Florida. If you trade back and get that extra pick, do you? Do you maybe even think about taking Jalen Smith with that pick that you just kind of gained? Or maybe one oh, of the absolutely. past players that we were talking about, Emmanuel Ogba or, or Kevin Dodd or even Stila Cravens that presents a little bit of value if you trade back a bit. So I, I would personally love the idea, but again, selfishly, I'd be a little bit bummed if we didn't get a pick in on Thursday night. Um, this is all kind of just speculation. Obviously, the rumor mill is just churning out all kinds of stuff right now. So I would... Uh, have a hard time imagining Denver or Cleveland or a team like that trading up to uh, try to get uh, uh, one of the quarterbacks, either Connor Cook or Cardale Jones or whoever the hell the NFL thinks could be a, a potential franchise quarterback. But I'd be all game for it. There's definitely good value right there around that 30 mark that you know is poten- you know right around the same as it is at the 27 mark. So yeah, and that's what my from the benches co-host Ryan Hilson is worried about with this trade down. Is he doesn't want it to be. With Cleveland, because that means that not only does Green Bay not pick, but we literally spend all of Friday figuring out who they're going to take with the first overall pick of the second round, and and so that creates a whole. Uh, That's just selfish of us. Though, yeah, it you know, is. In the grand scheme of things, <laughs> it, it doesn't it mean anything. But I think you nailed it on the head when you talked about Jalen Smith. Man, that's that's the way to go. I think if you can snag a free pick like that, that. And I know Ted Thompson obviously won't think like that because it's, that's not how it works. Like they're all worth the same. But as a fan, you think about the free one, and it's like, oh, let's let's stash Jalen Smith, absolutely freaking lutely. And uh, you know they could put him on IR the first week of the season, and it'd be like nothing ever happened until uh, 2016 when you have a top eight pick, or 2017, excuse me, when you have a a top eight pick that you probably shouldn't have had. Um, and then, of course, they'll be picking 32nd in the 2017 draft. We all know that. Hey, all. Uh, guys, let's talk about our ideal three-round mocks then. Let's make these semi-realistic. you know, realistic. Like, I, I, I'd love to take Laramie Tunsil in the first, Jalen Ramsey in the second, and DeForest Buckner in the third, but that's just not Well, that the sounds world. great. Let's do that, Ross. That's right. a good one. Yeah, that, that's just not the world that we live in. So, Jacob, hit me with your realistic, ideal three-round mock. It can be something you published. It certainly doesn't have to be. And it certainly, in this case, will not be because most people at this stage have already read that mock, or so I hope. I'm going to go different, too, Jacob, just so we give our listeners a little something different than we've written, too. Just, you know, there's so many good options and so many different ways we can go. We should probably switch it up a bit, right? I'll follow suit, then. I'll follow suit. There you go. So my first-round pick, I've talked about him a lot tonight, outside linebacker, Eastern Kentucky, Noah Spence. Pass rush wins titles. Packers need a guy beyond 2016. I think that you're going to see a run on defensive linemen at some point. I think you'll have one push down the board maybe, uh, but I think that eventually the value will be too much there for what could be really, if Noah Spence finishes his career at Ohio State, we're talking about a top 10 pick that we don't even have a dream of having at 27. I just think that's way too much to pass up. In the 3-4 scheme, the most important position is outside linebacker. You saw that. The only guy that Ted Thompson's ever traded back into the first round for is Clay Matthews. That's because he was an outside linebacker, a pass rusher. 
Packers need those guys. Noah Spence is my guy in round one. Round two is a guy that you're talking about defensive linemen that can fall. This is a guy that could. I know my guy Justice Mosqueda said on Pulse of the Pack the other night that this would be his first round pick. There are some teams that probably don't feel the same. UCLA's Kenny Clark in second round. I like him there. Uh, I wouldn't mind him as the 27th overall selection either, but I think that you're looking at a guy that could fall. One of these defensive linemen by sheer numbers is going to fall. That's what I said. I think you guys have wishful thinking, <laughs> and I love your optimism. I, I really do, but uh, I just can't see it. I can't. I mean, Jaron Reed and Kenny Clark, right? Two quintessential pigeonhole nose tackles, two down run stuffers. You know, they aren't as valuable as three down players, but they are still valuable, and both those guys are top-notch at their position. I, I just can't see him going to 57. But in your realistic mock, I, I mean, Jacob, I would, my heart was fluttering already thinking about Spence and Clark 1 and 2. I mean, that was that's ideal, so carry on with number 3. I would certainly be a little surprised, I suppose, uh, but going by the number theory, I just think that one guy's going to fall. That's the guy I'm picking, as you mentioned, two-down run guy. That could be a guy that can drop a little bit. Uh, he's seen as the guy... Behind Jaron Reed, which is a guy we'll talk about later, I'm sure. My third round pick is Jarrell Adams, the tight end out of South Carolina. Again, he's a guy that you kind of stash for a year. Uh, if Jared Cook pans out, great. You can bring him back. If he doesn't, then you got a guy who's been in the system. He knows the offense, and he'll be ready to go. I watched some tape on him the other day. Some of the stuff he does excites me quite a bit. Uh, I think that he can grow as a blocker. Uh, I think as far as athletically down the field, Ross, you've heard me say a million times, dynamic tight end, dynamic tight end, dynamic tight end. As far as that goes in this class, this is one of the only guys that can do those sorts of things. Uh, and I think that the Packers are going to be looking. If they draft a pass catcher, I really do think it's going to be a tight end. If they get in the third round and Jarrell Adams is still there, I think they snatch him up. So Noah Spence, Kenny Clark, Jarrell Adams. Those are my three first three picks. All right, Cody, go ahead. All right, Ross, I don't know which direction you're going to go, but I want to appease the fans here. Uh, I was having a conversation with just a, a casual Packer fan at work today, and I mentioned something about going D-line first, and he just about flipped the lid and scolded me for not taking an inside linebacker. So, uh, I picked 27. Funny. I'm going to go ahead. That was funny, by the way. Yeah, it, it was kind of funny. It was funny. It was re almost ridiculous. But um, I'm going to go Reggie Ragland. Uh, Alabama linebacker. Enough has been said about him at this point. I, I, he does shore up our linebacking core. He, he would become the immediate starter. Uh, I think the fans would be thrilled with that selection, finally getting the guy to solidify the middle of the field. So uh, if in this mock, I'm going to go Reggie Raglan. Round two, I'm going to go just a little bit off the board. Uh, Javon Hargrave, defensive tackle from South Carolina State. I think Jan Daniel Jeremiah of NFL had us actually taking him in the first round, so chances are of him falling to the bottom of second are slim, but it could potentially happen. Uh, to give you a little dossier on Hargrave, you know, a small, squatty guy, 6'1", 309, as Mayock likes to call him, big old bubble butt. He, he can play nose tackle, but he really just thrives penetrating. I mean, when we talk about two down linemen, you have Daniels and Hargrave. They're, I don't want to say similar player, because that's unfair to Hargrave. Daniels is you know, awesome, but Hargrave uh, makes tons of plays behind the line of scrimmage, held his own at the East-West Shrine game and the Senior Bowl. Uh, I think he, he's underrated against the run, really, uh, in the games that I've watched, but he's really a penetrator. He uses his hands well, has pass rush moves. I, I think he would be a great selection in, in round two. Um, he'd have a hard time starting in the base, but I think, again, with as much nickels we play, he'd be uh, uh, a really solid get there. And then in round three, um, why don't I go a uh, little bit? I, I switched to offense lineman. We mentioned Joe Hag. I'm not sure that he drops to round four. Uh, I do have that in my mock, and I, I said I wasn't going to double it, but just just solidify that offense lineman. Jacob, you mentioned the swing backup tackle has been a need. I mean, Bakhtiari missed a, a couple of games. Bulag is always banged up. It seems uh, we saw what a nightmare it was to have Barclay out there. So. I'm going to go Joe Hag at, uh, in round three and solidify that six swing back up tackle spot and, and almost an insurance just in case uh, Bakhtiari asks for the moon for whatever reason uh, next year in free agency. So uh, one Raglan, two Hargrave, three Hag. I'm going to say draft industrial complex be damned. I, I, I'm, 
I'm still mad that they they jacked this guy all the way. I've seen him even at like pick ten, but I, I'm gonna just go with what I thought originally, and that people are gonna get worried about his frame and, and Leonard Floyd at 27. That's an absolute dream pick. I mean, that's bad things got to happen. As far as I'm concerned, Leonard Floyd at 27 is like haha Clinton Dix at 21. I mean, I, and I mean that very, very seriously. Uh, then I'll go with. Uh, Adolphus Washington from Ohio State played in a 4-3 in college, but he's a guy uh, at 6-3 with 34 and a half inch arms that can kind of play all over. Uh, not maybe ideal 3-4 defensive lineman, but 6-3 is kind of that Josh Boyd size where it's still good enough uh, to get it done, and and I think that he's a uh, a good player that got in a little bit of trouble before Ohio State's bowl game, but certainly a guy that that uh, in that second round, I, I would say in an average defensive line draft class, he's being talked about at the top of the second round. Uh, maybe even you know a, a needy team has taken a guy of his caliber uh, at the end of the first. So in my opinion, there you have two extremely. Uh, extremely talented guys. And then I'm going to take my guy, BJ Goodson, in the third round. People are going to be... Uh, I, love, I love that, by the way. He, I had him mocked in my fourth. I just want, I forgot to mention that earlier. I love that pick. He, To me, if you don't get a Raglan in the first, which is fine, if you get a BJ Goodson in the third or fourth, I mean, you're sitting pretty, in my opinion. Yeah, I, I really like him. I, I, I really, really do as a player. I, I think that, uh, you know, with any of our three scenarios, because we are such draft heads and and pay so much attention to this stuff and obsess over it. If any of our three scenarios played out, I think we'd, we'd all three be doing uh, backflips. I, I think that the, these three mock drafts are, like you said, ideal. I mean, this is what you, you really hope for. Uh, sometimes, you know, more often than not, Thompson doesn't do anything that looks anything like it, and it turns out better than it would if we called the shots anyway, and that's why <laughs> he has his job and we have – our podcast, and that's uh, that's obviously kind of the way that that goes. But let's let's talk about some uh, some things that we've apparently stolen from Daniel Jeremiah. Uh, Red Star guys and Black Dot guys. Red Star guys is uh, guys that you pound the table for any position, any round. Mine's easy, you guys. We've already talked about it, but it's Joe Hag. He is absolutely uh, perfect in every way for what Green Bay needs in a mid-round offensive lineman. I think he can play left tackle in the league. I think he's instantly a better run defender than Bakhtari. I think he gives you leverage in those negotiations. Uh, I, uh, he can play right or left tackle in a zone blocking scheme. It doesn't matter. Slide in at either spot. Uh, I, what I don't think about Joe, though, and what you will see a lot from Thompson when he does draft these smaller school tackles like a a Lang or a, or a Treader or whatever, I don't think that uh, Joe Hag has the girth required to kick into guard. I think if you're drafting Joe Hag, you're drafting an offensive tackle. And that's fine. I mean, they're more valuable than guards anyway. But I just I have a hard time uh, bumping Joe inside. The, the, his predecessor at North Dakota State, Billy Turner, he was a left tackle at NDSU. He's now the starting right guard for the Dolphins. I just don't see the same frame and the same skill set. So that's that's my issue there. My only knock on Joe Hag would be uh, just that I, I, I honestly don't see him as a guard. That That's my, my only deal. Jacob, pound the table for somebody. Well, apart from Noah Spence, because I think it's been made very clear at this stage, that is my guy. Um my guy's going to be in the mid-rounds. That's going to be Paul Perkins, running back from UCLA. Ross, you mentioned my story <coughs> Excuse me, from earlier today. I think he fits this Packers offense like a glove. I think that you have a guy that can be your scat back, third down back, uh, James Stark's replacement, or if Eddie Lacy decides to chase some bigger money, which is kind of the going rate, six to seven mil for a running back, the Packers may not be willing to do that for a guy. That's had some issues in his career, to say the least. I expect a big year from Eddie Lacy to make those negotiations very difficult. But you're talking about a guy that could be at least the start of a very good tandem uh, with Paul Perkins and then a big bruiser type. If they're looking for 
a similar sort of thing that they have. But Paul Perkins, early in his career, that can be a guy that uh, that gives the Packers their pass catching running back that they haven't really had. Uh, I suppose the alternate if Perkins isn't there is Kenyon Drake, and the reason I feel that way is because he does a lot of the same things Perkins does. Uh, he can also contribute on special teams. I think that the Packers could use some competition in the punt return game. Micah Hyde had a very good year a couple years ago, not as good last year. And the value that he has on the defense, uh, as far as his kind of hybrid role, stuff like that, that may be something they don't really want to expose much in the return game. Plus, I think Drake gives you a more uh, special capability in the return game uh, as a punt returner and potentially a kickoff returner if they decide the same thing for Ty Montgomery or if Jeff Janis, for some reason, isn't supposed to be back there. They don't want him to be back there. So Perkins or Drake, both in the middle rounds. Sounds like we could have a uh, table-pounding party for you, me, and Paul Perkins. That's uh, uh, something that we certainly agree upon. I, I kind of like... Uh, I kind of like uh, Kenyon Drake. I think he's got a, a little bit of Ryan Grant syndrome, which is that he played in college behind kind of a legendary back. Ryan Grant played behind Julius Jones at Notre Dame. Obviously, uh, Julius had a, a productive career with the Dallas Cowboys and was extremely popular when he was at Notre Dame. And, and Derrick Henry set all sorts of records at Alabama. I think if Kenyon Drake would have had more of a feature role, you know, we might be talking about him... Uh, maybe a little bit more highly uh, as far as draft position is concerned. I, I just think he's a, a very talented player and a guy that I enjoy watching, and especially on special teams. I mean, you nailed it. That's where he can contribute right away, and I think he can really do a, a whole lot of different things with him in the offense as, as far as passing downs are concerned. Cody, go ahead and maybe touch on those guys and then give us your pound-the-table guy. Oh, well, my pound-the-table, my red star guy, is going to be uh, Nick Martin, uh, center from Notre Dame. Uh, I, I wanted to go Buckner or Ramsey or Bosa or whatever, one of the top-tier guys, Tunzel, but enough has been said about those guys. Nick Martin, for me, is my number one interior offensive lineman, and it's actually a decent class of interior offensive linemen this year with Ryan Kelly... Mm -hmm. His name really hot right now, and Joshua Garnett. But Martin to me, um, you guys recognize that name, Zach Martin's younger brother. For me, I just everything he does, he does so precisely. He's a technician. He's super strong. He can get to the second level. He seals blocks well. He can move his guy in the run game. For me, I'm pounding the table, and not, necessar not necessarily for the Packers, but a guy who's going to be a can't miss. Plug in the guy, uh, plug him in for ten plus years in the interior line at either guard or center. I think he's going to make your team better. And, and maybe it is a guy the Packers take for a replacement for Lang or Sitton or something along those lines. But for me, a, a guy that uh, if, if Thompson said, you know, Bauer, who's your guy that you think is can't miss? Put your red star by him. I'm going to put mine next to Nick Martin. All right, let's let's talk about uh, black dot guys. This is a guy you don't want any part of, uh, whether it has to do with his ability to play football or stuff that has gone on off the field. Give me your black dot guy, Cody. I'm going to go, and I'm sorry if I steal from you guys, Robert Kondiche from Ole Miss. And I even have him on my list of guys. Um, I have my list broken down. You'll check it out tomorrow at Sheetside TV of guys that I could be talked into liking. But for me, the black dot exists with him just because he's such an odd cat. And you hear that not only because of his story of jumping out the hotel, um, you know, four-story uh, window or whatever the case may have been in that situation. Just, I don't know if he loves football. Uh, the, he was the same guy he is as a junior as he is when he came in as a freshman. A uh, guy who flashes just all-world potential, athletic, you know, great three-tech, potential five-tech, you know, defensive player. But ultimately, he's just... Goes to the beat of his own drummer. He's wired a little bit differently. You can hear that talking about, or when he was talking at the Combine, he threw his teammate Tunzel under the bus of being in the hotel room with him, which is not what you want. I mean, the uh, Lakers situation comes to mind when I think about teammates, you know, disobeying or going against somebody's trust and, and with the rift it creates in the locker room. So for me, Kamdiche is a guy I would prefer to stay away from. 
I guess you could call that a black dot, but again, his talent on the field, you know, would warrant me being able to be talked into liking that pick potentially, but, you know, just too many questions off the field, and I wonder about his passion, and, and I don't want to compare someone to his brother, but his brother's had all kinds of problems when he was at Ole Miss, too. Generally, it's a, you know, family kind of atmosphere thing, so... I don't want to speak on too much what I don't know, but what I've heard and what I've read and all these kinds of things uh, is somebody I would prefer to stay away from. Jacob, how are you? Well, I came up with a couple, and thankfully, Cody, you did not steal all of them, although one of them was on the list. That's the guy you mentioned. Uh, The first guy I came up with is one of the first guys that came to mind. That's Kamale Correa, uh, outside linebacker. A stat I read, uh, Bill Huber, the king of the Statistics Are for Losers club, guy I also used to intern for. Uh, As far as stuff, if you guys need something for numbers, that's the guy. At Packer Report is his Twitter feed. He's got something good just about every day. But the stat he gave out was he had a four-game stretch against mediocre competition of no sacks and six tackles. Now, I know that those numbers don't necessarily tell the whole story, and I know tackles are kind of subjective, but when you're the other team's, when you're that team's supposed best player, I, I would think that you end up with more tackles or impact plays than those uh that's something that i have struggled with uh and i really wasn't too blown away by his tape that's kind of why i mentioned you know for me as far as the edge position goes it is Noah Spence and then everybody else and he's one of the kind of poster children for that the two other guys i have and cody we've talked about this before is alabama's jaron reed and the reason i say that is because he would require a first round pick more likely than not at least and i've mentioned I'm not big on taking players in the first round uh, that you can't play on third down. And I didn't see a whole lot, if anything, that really gave me a lot of impression that he could become somebody that rushes the passer. That's not somebody I'm willing to take in the first round, especially with guys like Vernon Butler, Andrew Billings, etc., that I do think offer some pass rush there. And one other guy I've seen mock to the Packers a lot, I'm not sure if it's because he's a Caucasian tight end and those things you know, tend to be associated with Green Bay, but Nick Vanette out of Ohio State is a guy I've seen mock to Green Bay as early as the second round, and the first thing I always read about him is, Ohio State didn't use him a lot in the passing game, but, well, how the hell do you know that he can become anything in the passing game if you've never actually seen it? I know he's got some decent numbers, but he, if Ohio State thought he was a dynamic enough pass catcher, then I think that Urban Meyer, and as much as I hate the guy, I have so much respect for him as an offensive mind, especially in college football. He finds a way to utilize playmakers. Uh, He found a way to use Braxton Miller as a wide receiver. That's a position he'd never played before, and he found a way to make him effective there. And Braxton Miller, we're talking about a guy who's probably a second- to third-round pick. Nick Vanette was never used. He was pretty much a blocker, which definitely has a role. Uh, But I think if you're looking for a blocking tight end, you're looking in the later rounds. I just don't see that guy as something that I want. Uh, when there's other guys available, you know, you've talked about, uh, well, I've talked about Jarrell Adams, Thomas Duarte is one, um, Tyler Higby's one. He's got some character flaws to him, and he had a really weird incident not that long ago uh, that might make him undraftable. That's still a guy I think that I would even consider looking at before I would look at a guy that, when his first label is, he's never offered anything in the passing game, but. I'm not big on a guy like that. Uh, I think that you can find guys like that just about anywhere. Matthew Mulligan is an example of a guy like that that can be a blocking tight end if that's what the Packers are looking for. Ross, if you don't mind, I just want to jump in. I love Tyler Higby. He's my number two tight end. I really wish he just didn't get arrested. (laughs) Uh, That's really unfortunate for him. And the story is true uh, that came out with the racial slurs and, and, and punching the guy in the face and putting him in the hospital. That's obviously a huge red flag, but to me, he's Travis Kelsey-ish light, almost, who is, you know, often referred to as baby Gronk. So if we really want a pass-catching tight end that we could get late, if, if we interviewed him uh, at any point and, and he checked out like he was okay mentally, I would love it if we took a stab at him. And and this is also the team that took a, a, a stab at uh, Colt Lyra late, uh, in the undrafted free agent. So if Higby fell... I just wanted to point out that I would love that selection. Colt Lyra, there's about three episodes of From the Benches that we're never getting back. Yes. Uh, I, I think at this point, you guys have pretty much covered my guys, although there are two guys that I just want absolutely nothing to do with, and, and one of them 
They're, actually, they're probably go, both going to be gone, and that's just fine. But I, I've seen some Laquan Treadwell and some Josh Doxson, and, and no thank you. I mean, if if Green Bay is going to take a receiver in the first round, fine. But it better be a speed merchant like Corey Coleman, who I, I'm just in love with. I, I really am. And I know Cody has an issue with that, which is, is fine. But those guys aren't they, – they don't get open. What they do is – is is have a tremendous ability to win contested catches. The problem with that is we've already got guys that don't get open. And secondly, the quarterback doesn't trust young guys to make contested catches anyway, so I don't know what the hell you'd want another one of those guys on the team for. I, I, what I just, do you want another 5'10 receiver for? What? What do you want another 5'10 receiver for? Because he's always open. It's the same thing with Sterling Shepard. But we got Montgomery coming back. I, I love Doxon. I, I, I think you're discrediting him too much. And I, I do like Coleman. He's my fourth rank wide out. But I just, sorry to butt in there. No, it's it's fine. I mean, this is what this is about, this discussion. Coleman's actually, honest to God, my top rank wide out in this whole class. I, 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 I know Jeremiah's got him up there too, but there's just something about Doxon. He, he never gets open. He, he's always open. Even if he's covered, he's open. Right, right. No, I know. I'm talking about like actual space between him and his defender. Sure, sure. And, and your point about <laughs> Rodgers is actually a very good point. You're about he doesn't trust those guys. He doesn't trust to throw him cover. You know, he trusts James Jones. You know, he's always covered. Yeah, he trusts Jones to make to make a play. And you know, and that's that's not a discredit to Rodgers. That's being smart with the football. But right, right. Yeah, <laughs> James Jones hasn't been open a day in his life. I I understand what you're what you're saying though. I I do. So that those are my two guys that I'm just when I saw, I think it was Bucky Brooks or something. And it was Laquan Treadwell at 27. I I almost had a stroke. I was I was not a happy man. Guys, I'm gonna Tread, cl- go Treadwell ahead. Is my trade back scenario that I would be comfortable with if we moved back and gained an extra pick, and all of a sudden he's still there for. You know, because he ran a four six. Let's be honest. I mean, on tape, he's a he's a great receiver, but a four six wide receiver does not go in the top ten. He's not AJ Green. He's not Julio Jones. I think that that notion has been you know dispelled often now. So if we traded back and somehow gained an extra pick and he was there, like maybe yeah, sure, I could see that. But. And I think you know, Aaron Nagler brought up a good point too. Is they they if they are going to go receiver early, it needs to be a fast guy and and. That's led to some uh, Will Fuller noise that kind of uh, parrots the, I don't know if you guys remember the Marquise Lee noise, but there was some Marquise Lee noise two years ago uh, in round one. I, I think it was round one. Yeah, the year we took Ha Clinton Dix, people were saying that uh, Green Bay was obsessed with, with Marquise Lee, but these random Will Fuller allegations uh, that I'm that I'm getting are are reminding me of you know Green Bay likes receiver X in round one even though Ted Thompson doesn't take receiver anybody in round one. Let's close now with uh, well, what, Russ. Let's just can we touch on receiver quickly? I mean, this is such a hot topic. I got into it with another a Packer guy and a Bleacher Report uh, editor and, and Jacob and I were talking about. What, if we draft a receiver round one, say it's Will Fuller, right? Does he immediately step in and start over Devonta Adams? Is that just is Adams' book closed at that point? I mean, where do you? How do you justify? We have six on paper right now that have contributed at one point or another. I just don't understand the idea of taking one in round one and and closing the book on a lot of these guys, saying, "Okay, sorry, Adams, your time has come and gone. You've proven you can't stay healthy and you can't catch. Yada yada." You're done. I mean, is that really the route that's that's smart to go? No, I, I really don't think it is. And in that argument, I would have more than likely agreed with you. My my deal is really that I, I really love Corey Coleman. I mean, a that's lot. That's fair. And that's why I have Doxon as someone I can be talking to because you just love that guy, right? Right. So that's my deal. But, no, I – because I actually am probably, I don't know about Jacob, but I know for certain you, I'm probably the highest guy on Devontae Adams in, in, on this podcast. I just don't, I don't feel like his career is over in, the, in a way that a lot of other guys do. I saw too much uh, from him against New England and too much from him against Dallas his, his uh, rookie year for me to say that uh, Ted Wift, I, I just, I've got a problem. I've got a problem with that, and the only 
You know, the only reason would be like, okay, well, we're going to, sorry, we're going to replace Jared Aberderis with Corey Coleman. And then I would be like, okay, well, that's life. <laughs> you know what I mean? That That's uh, what I'm, what I'm kind of thinking. But uh, at the same time, no, I hope they go a different direction. Very, very seriously, I, I hope that they do go uh, a different direction. It's just, for me, it's a specific player. And it would be Corey Coleman in round one or... Sterling Shepard in round two. Other than that, I'm kind of out. Like, I don't have any interest in a fourth-round wide receiver. I, I think that accomplishes damn near nothing. I'm with you, man. I'm with you there. I mean, my guy is Dachson, but you're, you're, we're on the same page as far as that goes. I just, it's it's almost unfathomable to think about how many uh, fans out there are clamoring for a wide receiver early just because, well, none of our guys could get open last year. Well, that this is true, but... You forget that Jordy, our best receiver, top five, top seven wide receiver in the league, was out. Montgomery, our third-round pick, who I'll mention our offense was actually just fine when he was in for the first you know, five and a half games or whatever it was. You know, He was out all year. I mean, you're getting two guys back, uh, a second-round pick, who top seven receiver, and a, a third-round pick just from last year back. It's hard to even justify it to pencil in somebody to fit on that roster, you know, to, to make that work. And... Again, I, I'm not ready to write the book on Adams. I'm not even a big Adams guy, to be honest. I think he drops too much. His chemistry hasn't been great with Rodgers. But, uh, you know, he was forced into the number one outside role last year uh, unfairly to him because he wasn't ready. And he's, what, 22 years old only? I think we drafted him when he was real young. So, you know, the the book isn't closed on him. It, it's time for a new chapter. And I'm not going to expect, you know, 100 catches and 1,500 yards by any means, but. With with Nelson back, I can you know the pressure is going to be off him. I think he's going to have a productive year. And and if if we do get a guy early, okay, well then you're almost playing for the future when when Jordy's contract is done, or even if Adams done, never does pan out and you can supplace him. But it, it's not you know a, a 2016 need like it is for defense alignment, inside linebacker, or even edge in 2017. Yeah, and you're right. You know, he was a redshirt sophomore in a very non-pro style offense when Green Bay drafted him. Certainly a long-term investment that people were ready for it to pan out, like right now, especially after that off-season MVP talk from the quarterback and the head coach. Jake, I'm going to let you talk in a second, but I've got to go on a mini rant, and, and I know those are your favorite, but I'm going to talk to Packers Internet Commenter guy for just a minute here because of something that Cody brought up, and it's this concept that, and I'm going to just relate it to the wide receivers because if I get into the entire roster, it's just going to make me mad and take up like way more time than we have. But I, I had a guy on one of my posts comment, very simply, they can't keep having the same players on the team and expecting to get any better. That is the biggest crock of anything I've ever read, read because that's exactly how this team wins constantly. And you have to look at the wide receiver group that way. Jeff Janis is going to make the year two to year three jump. Jared Aberderis is going to make the year to year, year two to year three jump. Uh, Devontae Adams is going to make the year two to year three jump. And, excuse me, Ty Montgomery is going to make the rookie to sophomore jump. Those jumps in comfort level, in production, in strength, in technique, those jumps are what you get from sophomore Jordy Nelson, who's dropping every other pass that he looks at, to third-year Jordy Nelson, who's you know damn near winning Super Bowl MVP, to fourth, fifth, sixth-year Jordy Nelson, who's one of the best six receivers in the league. You have to let a draft and develop team develop. And so that's why closing the book on Adams is dumb. Wanting to immediately replace Ty Montgomery is dumb. And even giving up on, on Jared Aberderis and Jeff Janis is a little bit short-sighted. So... That's my miniature rant, and it just drives me insane when people want to replace guys because young players aren't productive. You just need to chill out and let the young players develop, especially guys with high draft pedigrees, especially Ted Thompson guys with high draft pedigrees. Jacob, do you have anything to say? Quite a bit. Uh, to go back to Devontae Adams, we're talking receivers. You know, I think that you'll 
find out very early how they feel about Devontae Adams. If they take a receiver at the 27th pick, that means to some degree at least that they have sort of kind of closed the book on Devontae Adams or at least don't believe that he's the star that they build him up to be in the offseason last year where he was offseason MVP, making highlight catches in training camp, et cetera, et cetera. However, for the people that want to just close the book on Adams, I would say, Ross, I agree with you, you know, New England, Dallas, the end of his season before Richard Rodgers fell on him was pretty good. I know he wasn't the star that he was built up to be. However, if you look back at the receivers that the Packers have drafted in recent years, the only guy that's made a huge impact in his second season was Randall Cobb. And Randall Cobb, it was a perfect storm. He was a weapon that the Packers did not have. They didn't have a slot receiver like him. He was able to make a lot of plays in the middle of the field for that Packers offense. I think that you'll see uh, the Packers. I don't think you'll see them pick a receiver. I really struggle to see that simply because, like you said, High draft pedigree, high Ted Thompson draft pedigree, and more often than not, I am struggling to remember a receiver that did not get injured, that Ted Thompson picked in the second round, or later, that hasn't turned into a stud. Coach, you mentioned Ty Montgomery. That's another guy. If the Packers pick a receiver, he's a guy that slides down the depth chart then. And like you said, the offense was pretty good that first six, five and a half, six games uh, when Montgomery was in the lineup. I think that you're looking at Devontae Adams having a very good year with Jordy Nelson back. You've got Jordy. If they run four receivers with Jordy and Devontae on the outside with Cobb and Montgomery in the slot uh, in a four-receiver package or pull off one of those slot receivers for Jared Cook, I think you're looking at an offense. I really think that the talk of the demise of the Packers offense has been too great. Uh, You guys were talking about Laquan Treadwell. I have a source in the room with me. Little brother is proving some use. Don Banks actually has the Packers picking Laquan Treadwell at 27. That's another thing. Again, if they do that, I I really just think that means that they're done with Devontae Adams. Now, if they take a receiver um, in the later-ish rounds, two, three, four-ish time frame, then you're looking at a guy who's replacing Jared Aberderis. But, Ross, I agree with you completely on the idea of the Packers have guys that have contributed in some way, shape, or form on their roster. Six guys, Cody, you said that too. There's six guys that have contributed in some way, shape, or form. I really think if the Packers select a pass catcher, it's going to be a tight end of the future. I really struggle to see them go receiver early unless there's something that's just there that they absolutely positively cannot pass up. I've mentioned before, you know, the question kind of was posed of who's the guy that's a skill position at the 27th pick? that you would be happy with or not upset with if they took him. I'm with Cody. That guy's Josh Doxson. I don't hate Corey Coleman by any stretch. Uh, I just think that a guy who's that size and tends to win outside the numbers, that may be something that struggles on the NFL level. But from a receiver standpoint, I think the Packers are fine. If they add a late-round speed guy, fine and dandy. I don't think too highly of Jared Aberderis. I'm not a Jeff Janis cultist. And I'll go on record. If I'm wrong, make fun of me. I really think Devontae Adams is going to look like a different player this year. I think he's going to have a big year. That may not reflect the numbers because Jordy Nelson's back. Randall Cobb should be back to form because of that. Those guys suck up the majority of the targets. Jared Cook, I imagine, will be a big part of the offense as well. But I really think Devontae Adams is going to have a very good year. So as for what you're talking about, I agree completely. You're getting jumps from guys. I think people forget about organic growth. They just remember what they saw in the last part of the year, another guy we mentioned, James Jones. James Jones was the Packers' best receiver last year. I don't know that you can really argue that. That's a guy that we couldn't wait to get out of Green Bay after a Super Bowl season because he, quote, dropped everything. And he was a pretty good player in that second contract for the Packers and a very good player last year for the Packers, considering that they just kind of dragged him in off the street to be the savior of the offense. And that's really what he was for the first six or seven weeks. So I really struggle to see them taking a pass catcher early. I really... I know we spent a lot of time on it. I know that people have really thought that that's the case. I know that some people tend to believe Jordy won't be around much longer. I don't believe that. Uh, I think that that's a guy who I know he's given the Packers two team-friendly contracts. That's a, that's a guy that just says Packer for life. If the Packers give him a three-year contract after this year, kind of let him work his way out of the offense, work his way into retirement that way, I think that he'll be able to do that. And I think that, like I said, I struggle to see them looking at receiver in the early rounds because there's six guys there, and those are guys that Ted Thompson drafted, uh, every single one of them. 
you know, the lowest draft pick they have on the roster is Jeff Janis, and he's a special teams ace. So that's a guy who makes the roster automatically simply because he's that good on special teams. So all that being said, to kind of break it down into bullet points, don't see them taking a receiver because I think Devontae Adams is going to be good next season, and I think that the guys behind him are guys that they trust as well. Yeah, I, I think Nelson, two things with Nelson. First of all, I think Nelson is a guy whose skill set really uh, – is going to lead to him aging well. I, I think he'll be one of those Jerry Rice, Tim Brown type of guys uh, where they are they are effective players into their 30s. And I'm not saying that you know those two guys are probably Hall of Famers. I don't know if Jordy's Hall of Famer. Maybe he is. Maybe he's not. Probably not. But um, just guys that I think understand football and, and that I think will be effective later in his career. I think he's a guy that wants to retire Packer. And I think that I, I honestly think that he and the quarterback would like to, um, you know, finish their careers together. I think that Nelson and Rodgers are, are two guys that I really feel like uh, would like to play together until, you know, basically they're done playing. Obviously, uh, Nelson might play a few years after Rodgers retires, but at the same time, you know, maybe not. I think they were only honestly like two draft classes away from each other. Uh, wouldn't surprise me for you know, at all for Rodgers to hang it up like when he go turns 40 and, and Nelson to play till he's 38 or so. But, yeah, that that's my thoughts on those situations. We've gone for quite a while here, guys. Let's uh, wrap her up maybe a little bit, close with one last question just posed by Jacob Westendorf, and that is because of the, the talent level of the player and the need on the, the Packers roster, what is the absolute earliest that you would be comfortable taking Jalen Smith, Cody Bauer? Oh, man. I could... Hmm. Let's go... I want to say second round. Just, But I, I have a hard time doing that depending on who the first round pick was, if that makes sense. Uh, why don't I go third round? I would be extremely comfortable if... Hey, Friday wraps up. Packers have a D lineman, possibly an inside guy or, or an edge, or maybe even two D linemen. And in the third round, they take Jalen Smith. I would be pretty, pretty damn thrilled. But um, I'm sure you guys read it. There are reports that are thinking that he won't get out of the second round, or I think Schefter reported that. So, but for me, if if the Packers did take him in the second round, I suppose it could be talked into that, depending on again on who the first round pick is. But for the for the sake of this right now, I will say third round. I would feel pretty damn good about it. Jacob. Well, it was my question, and Cody. I'm glad to see you struggle with it because that means it was a good question. So, to go with what we're talking about, Jalen Smith. Obviously, the reports came out of the combine. Jalen Smith loves Mike McCarthy. The Packers reportedly love him as well. There was a report by. Walter football that there were teams at the end of the first round before his last recheck that he could be in play at the end of the first round for one of those playoff teams. I struggle to see that knowing the way that Ted Thompson builds his team. And we've obviously seen how the off season has progressed. You know, we're talking about needs. They still have needs on the defensive line. They have needs on the inside. They have needs on the edge. They address their needed tight end and free agency. So for all intents and purposes, they are quote-unquote good at tight end, I suppose. They could get by without addressing that position. The other three positions, I don't think they can get by without addressing. Uh, for that reason, I think you need at least two contributors added to this team before you take Jalen Smith. I think what I would do, and this is me, this is a guy who had a medical recheck that basically said he may never play football again. Now, people have likened it to Marcus Lattimore, guys like that. You know, guys that have injury issues and, you know, there's been talk that they could fall out of the draft altogether, and I don't think that's going to be the case, obviously, with Jalen Smith. But those guys tend to go in the third to fourth round range. We were talking about bonus picks earlier. The picks that are those are trade-down picks, picks they didn't have at the beginning, or compensatory picks, picks they got because a guy left. So if they make if that scenario happens where they trade back with, say, Denver or Cleveland and pick up an extra third in that scenario – I'd be okay with him in the third round there. Otherwise, I'm looking at a I'm looking at him at pick 131 or 137, one of those compensatory picks. I think I said that to you, Ross, at the beginning of the whole Jalen Smith injury process. Listen, if the guy pans out, he's a great player. Uh, you know, he was one of the top 
according to some of the SI guys, he would have been number one in their class. That's like adding another first-round pick later in the draft. I understand all that. However, I think when it's a pick that you have with as many other needs as the Packers have, I don't think that's a guy that you can select with one of your first two picks and maybe not even your third actual pick. I'm looking at a bonus selection. So third round, late fourth, that's when I'm comfortable to start taking him. You redshirt him for a year. If he pans out, great. If he doesn't, then it was kind of a bonus pick that you're not missing a whole lot out of anyways. You look, Just a quick jump in. What's tough is none of us cut the checks, you know? He, he could sign it, and it's none of our none of our butts on the line as far as if he does pan out or doesn't pan out. It's not us who has to pay him any kind of guaranteed money. Um, it's easy for us to speculate, but until you're that person sitting in the chair writing out that check for that guaranteed dollar amount, it, it, you know we don't really even know. It could be much later than we even think, or some team could be feeling like gambling. But we're we're kind of the same boat, Jacob. I mean. A third, third round, fourth round. I said I could probably be talked into the second, but right around that sweet spot, you know, third, fourth would be would be ideal. Yeah, third round's my magic number. I think you've got to get two contributors before you start stashing guys. And uh, Ted's never stashed a guy. I, I I can't think of another one right now besides Lattimore, but I know there have been uh, guys that at least weren't going to play right away. Not necessarily first round talents, but guys that maybe third round talents that you could stash in the sixth round, things like that. I just, for whatever reason, right now those names are escaping me. But I, I really would like to see the Packers get two. Brandon contrib- Thomas, offensive lineman from Clemson, San Fran took him as well. Yep. He never panned out. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. Uh, but yeah, that that was the guy that that I was uh, thinking of as as well as, as one of those stash guys. And San Francisco loved those guys. And unfortunately for them, neither of them um, re- really turned out, to be honest with you. But uh, as, as Packers fans, it doesn't make me too incredibly sad. Guys, thank, thanks for sticking with us this long. We really appreciate your, your listenership. We hope that this level of content uh, provided for you on draft day is uh, helping you pass the time between whenever you get to work or wake up or, or get on the road to wherever you're going and 7 o'clock when the commissioner steps to the podium. Jacob, Cody, thanks for coming on. Uh, we obviously want to thank Brian Caribou for his time this evening. And uh, one more time, thank all you guys for listening. Uh, thanks, everybody, for listening to this edition of the Packers War Room. And Go Pack Go!